Almhod, Smeiland, Sweden. It was in this harsh and inhospitable, cold, windswept glacial land that a tongue-tied, dyslexic boy began to sketch the concept of the company that later became known throughout the world, IKEA. People say that Ingvar Kamprad built his empire out of nothing, with his bare hands. But what does it actually mean? Fedor Ingvar Kamprad was born on the 30th of March in 1926 on the Elmtary farm near the small village of Agunerud in Sweden. He was very loved by his grandmother, who decades ago moved from Germany to Sweden with three small children and a husband who couldn't endure the burden of lack of money and committed suicide. The soil on the farm was too stony and infertile, so farming was not enough, and Ingvar's father worked in a local store while Ingvar's mother rented out rooms to tenants. During summer, the Kamprad family rented out all the rooms in their house to the guests and handled in one bedroom sleeping all together instead. Parents hoped for their son to become someone much wealthier, so insisted on his studying, which was difficult for a boy with dyslexia. However, this illness didn't interfere with his first entrepreneurial skills. His aunt sent him a package of matches, which cost 88 ore and consisted of 100 matchboxes. Ingvar realized that he would make good money selling matches that retail for 2, 3, or even 5 ore per box. Later, Ingvar sold pens, postcards, seeds, fish, and lungberries. Once his father told him that he wanted to build a road on the farm, but he didn't have enough money, so Ingvar borrowed money for the first and last time in his life. He took 90 krona from his dad and another 500 krona from a bank manager he knew those days. Ingvar bought 500 pens at 1 krona each and sold them for 4.5 krona. So he helped his father with the road, and he wasn't even 15 years old. Ingvar was growing up during the heyday of Nazi Germany, under the leadership of Hitler. His grandmother genuinely admired Hitler and his plans for a greater Germany. Perhaps this was because she felt more German than Swedish. The impressionable Ingvar was more influenced by the family than anyone else. He really loved his grandmother and father, listened to their stories, and not surprisingly, he couldn't resist the romance of pro-German views. From Per Anhalt's archives, the world discovered that Ingvar Kamprad was a member of his pro-Nazi group, Neo-Swedish Movement. At first, Ingvar called the publications a lie and denied his participation. Newspapers were full of headlines, Nazi skeleton in IKEA closet. After he realized what a huge damage it could do to him and his company, he wrote a letter called My Biggest Fiasco, in which he tried to justify himself, assuring that he attended those meetings because for him, a lonely guy who had no friends, it was a new type of relationship. It was the friendship he dreamed of, and he didn't yet fully realize that he was victim of a huge delusion. In the spring of 1943, when Ingvar turned 17, he opened his own company, IKEA. This name is nothing more than an abbreviation. I, Ingvar, K, Kamprad, E, Antarud, A, Agunarud. The main products at that time were pens. By 1945, while working as a clerk, he was also selling hundreds of saws, which he bought for 65 krona and sold for 90. In those years, the goods by mail format began to gain popularity. Once, having seen an advertisement for furniture in newspaper, Ingvar decided to start selling furniture by mail, in addition to fountain pens, wallets, watches, jewelry, and ladies' nylon stockings. He contacted one of several small furniture manufacturers and took for a trial a coffee table and a chair, which he called rug since remembering the inventory numbers of goods was always difficult for him. In 1949, he ran an advertising in a weekly agricultural newspaper, urging people to buy furniture at dealer prices. The newspaper had a circulation of 285,000 copies. It was a huge audience that led to a huge amount of sold pieces of furniture. In the spring of 1952, it was decided that IKEA would only sell furniture. Ingvar bought a place and turned it into a two-story furniture gallery so his clients could understand the quality difference between his products and his competitors. Thousands of people from all over Sweden were coming to warehouse with catalogs in their hands. The IKEA furniture fair became almost a tourist attraction. Traveling was not cheap, but to those who went to IKEA for furniture, they offered a free lunch, as Ingvar believed that good business is not done on empty stomach, and also a discount on a train ticket. In 1958, the first IKEA store opened in Elmhold. In 1956, at the age of 53, his mother died of cancer. It was a heavy loss for Ingvar. Four years later, he also got divorced after 10 years with Kirsten Watling. So to go through this emotional period of his life, Ingvar turned to drinking. 
for most of the rest of his life, he also drank and fought this addiction, periodically stopping to keep his habit under some kind of control. Ingvar met his second wife during his trip to Italy, a primary school teacher, Margareta Stenner. They got married in 1963, and a year later their first son was born. Ingvar at that time was already 37 years old. The next two sons were born two and four years later. Margareta became a housewife, while Ingvar was absorbed in building his empire. Low prices for key wooden furniture was a serious threat to other manufacturers. Competitors demanded to impose a ban on his company and close his exhibition. Boycotts of Swedish manufacturers began. Ingvar was forced to resist the merchants who tried to stop the development of his young company at any cost. In 1952, the National Association of Furniture Dealers completely banned the sale of IKEA products at exhibitions that were very popular those days, and Ingvar himself was forbidden to attend some of the fairs. So Ingvar opened several firms and intermediary companies and could simultaneously play the role of furniture explorer, seller, and buyer. Many suppliers gave up and began to refuse to cooperate with Ingvar because the association also delivered an ultimatum. If you sell IKEA, then we will no longer purchase your product. Those suppliers who stayed with IKEA were afraid to deliver goods during the day. Only at night, mysterious tracks with sofas appeared at Ingvar's warehouse. In 1957, information about what was happening reached the National Commission on Prices and the Free Trade Council. The powerful monopoly of the Stockholm Chamber of Commerce tried its best to keep customers from learning about the company's low prices. It was such an unfair war against IKEA, but destructive attempts by competitors and Furniture Dealer Association to keep IKEA out of the fairs had the opposite effect. The number of visitors to fairs without IKEA participation was dropping sharply, and only then other manufacturers began to oppose the boycott themselves. There is a golden rule in IKEA's business philosophy. Treat every challenge as an opportunity. Problems give amazing chances. When we were forbidden to buy the same furniture that was made for others, we started to come up with our own design, and we had our own style. When we lost suppliers in our country, the rest of the world opened up for us. Ingwa was very happy to discover the traditional love of furniture and woodworking among the Poles. And the prices, they were amazingly low. For the Poles, quantity mattered the most, but the technology of production itself was completely undeveloped, and it took a long time to introduce concepts such as certification and quality standards. Soon, Ingwer brought a large number of used machines from Sweden and installed them in Poland. Six to seven primitive factories turned an extensive network of 160 manufacturing enterprises. In the late 60s, Polish furniture occupied 50% of the IKEA catalog. This may be a surprise to you, but it was not IKEA that first came up with the idea of collapsible furniture. IKEA was the first to make this idea commercially successful. Back in the 50s, boycott years, when IKEA suppliers were under the scrutiny of competitors, IKEA itself had to get out and change furniture beyond recognition so the competitors couldn't accuse the company of plagiarism. Ingwer himself never knew how to draw, but Julius Lundgren was very inventive and perfectly embodied his ideas on paper. One day, when Gillis was photographing a table that was to be packed later, he exclaimed, Oh my god, how much space does it take up? Let's unscrew the legs from it and put them under the countertop. The more collapsible part the furniture had, the less it was injured during transportation and the lower the cost. IKEA was able to save huge amounts of money in production and shipping, and thus lower prices for customers. By the way, when years later Ingvar was asked where did he get such an artistic taste, he sharply replied, I have no taste, I couldn't furnish my own room, but I know others who could. Ingvar dreamed of ensuring not only the long life of IKEA, but also his independence from any country. He was categorical and old-fashioned. He didn't want to turn IKEA into a public company, participate in a stock exchange and make loans. He wanted the company to continue to flourish and develop many years after his death. This prompted him to think about moving the business to ensure the eternal life of his company. But moving IKEA abroad was not easy, and the main reason was the difficult financial situation of Ingwer Comprat himself. Yep, that's right. In general, by that time, Ingwa owed the company a huge amount, 18 million krona, because he used to constantly borrow money to pay high taxes on property and on the capital of the company. At that time, there was only one way to reduce the property tax, to sell the company that you owned to another company that was also your property. Thus, Ingwa began to use an ingenious schema of several companies in order to pay off his debt. 
from his income from them. In the period from the mid-70s to the mid-80s, IKEA continued its expansion at a rapid pace. Ideas flowed like water, and prospects and new investments were fascinating. As it turned out later, the generous investment of IKEA technology in Polish production, which began in the 60s, was risky. IKEA invested about $5.5 million in the mechanization of production at one of the Polish factories. But after the fall of the Berlin Wall, the Polish side determined the contract, although all the equipment had already been delivered and paid for. From 1978, relationship with Poland became strained, and orders fell from 100 million to 50 million. The year before, Ingwer had also made a number of long-term investments to conquer the Russian market. He wanted to lease a piece of forest in Siberia and lease 100,000 hectares of forest land for 99 years where he was going to build a sawmill, brought equipment from Sweden, and planned to build a factory for processing timber. However, the sluggishness of IKEA, combined with the activity of the Russian mafia, crime, and the irresistible Soviet bureaucracy, derailed everything. According to the financial report, taking into account the loss of time and labor of many people, the total amount of IKEA's losses from the deal with Russia ranges from 100 to 125 million krona. In Romania, IKEA also lost about 50 million krona by investing in factory upgrades. In Malaysia and Thailand, having built a large factory for the production of chairs on shares with a local entrepreneur, IKEA also faced failure. Ingwer realized that since one cannot rely on existing production, it means the company itself must become a manufacturer. In 1991, IKEA became a manufacturer by acquiring Svetwood in Sweden, with branches in Canada and Denmark. Later, with Svetwood, IKEA gained experience in managing production in other industries – in Slovakia, Hungary, Ukraine, Romania, and the Baltic countries. In Poland, IKEA also established its own production. Svetwood opened five of its own sawmills and two furniture factories. The personality of Ingvar Kamprad, his modesty, the fact that being a billionaire, he bought clothes at sales, rode trains, flew economy class, and stayed in cheap hotels on every business street called his worst colleagues, drove an old Volvo and didn't give interviews, added another touch to the legendary portrait. Ingwer seemed to melt into the crowd. However, skeptics argue that all this is a PR move designed to support the image of IKEA, which focuses primarily on the budget-conscious customers. Well, in 1997-1998, the company's turnover reached 50 billion krona. Ingwer Kamprad has repeatedly topped the list of the richest people in Sweden. In 2017, the Swedish business magazine Bekken Zafera estimated Kamprad's fortune at 620 billion krona. Ingvar Kamprad died at the age of 91 in his native land. His experience in business taught him to hate elitism of any kind and attempts to infringe on it and push others around. Ingvar considered himself not like everyone else, and in this sense, he was one of us. He knew what it meant to be strange, to feel angry when faced with injustice. Today, IKEA has 460 stores operating in 63 countries around the world. The IKEA brand brings together thousands of employees and hundreds of companies with different owners around the world. The retail business is organized according to the franchising system. The company's turnover for 2021 amounted to almost $46 billion. And his story teaches us that anyone can rise above the odds and succeed through perseverance, resourcefulness, and dedication. In conclusion, we advise you to heed the advice of Ingvar Kamprad himself. The word impossible should be excluded from our vocabulary. Keep up learning, guys. Success is just the number of attempts.